Okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much for being here. This is a really packed room. Um, so uh, as Inka mentioned, my name's Denise. I'm Mark. Um, so what we're going to be talking to you about today is an experiment that Pivotal Cloud Foundry ran over the last year and a half or so. So the title of our talk is, what if you treat your pipeline like an internally facing product? Um, and of course, those are our Twitter handles. Feel free to tweet at us. Feel free to complain at us on the internet. That's fine too. So without further ado, um, hello. A little introduction. Um, my name's Denise. I've been working at Pivotal for about a year and a half now. Um, I currently work on a team that uh, enables other teams to build on-demand services for Cloud Foundry. I'm Mark. I'm a software engineer at Pivotal also, and I'm currently working on an open source project, Cloud Foundry Container Runtime, which is helping users deploy Kubernetes. So why are we here today? Um, we're going to share with you the results of an experiment that Pivotal R&D ran with over the last year and a half, as I mentioned. Um, the purpose of this experiment was to find ways to more effectively facilitate continuous delivery for many teams that were doing something kind of similar. So this is a kind of silly representation of the scientific method. Hopefully everyone's heard of this before. Um, we're going to deliver this talk in six stages, as there are six stages of the scientific method. Um, what we did was we first made an observation and then asked some questions, made some hypotheses, uh, and then we conducted the experiment. So right now we're sort of in the draw conclusions and report your results stage. We're going to take you through each of these steps and what they look like for this internally facing product. So first, a little bit of background on what it is that we do and the space that we work in because this will uh, make the rest of the talk make sense. So we work on Pivotal Cloud Foundry, which happens to be an enterprise distribution of Cloud Foundry. Um, Cloud Foundry, uh, can I see a show of hands? Who has heard of Cloud Foundry before? Who has used Cloud Foundry before? Okay, so fewer hands. Cloud Foundry is a platform as a service. Um, I'll talk about what that is in a second. Uh, we sort of come in in the blue, red, and yellow boxes in the data services. So one of Pivotal Cloud Foundry's value adds for customers is that we take care of the entire lifecycle management for data services. What those are, I'll talk about in a second. So Cloud Foundry is a platform as a service. What that means is it's simply an opinionated way to deploy virtual machines that work together to make your applications run as securely and as easily as possible. Um, Cloud Foundry, the reason why people use Cloud Foundry is because they don't want to think about all the plumbing that has to happen when you try to run applications in the cloud. Um, by adopting a platform such as Cloud Foundry, it means that your application developers can focus on writing code and spend less time on sort of like all the plumbing. Um, where services come in is that applications are stateless in Cloud Foundry, um, which means that if you need to persist any data, you got to find another place to put it. Uh, in order to support persistent state, this is where services come in. Um, so what we do is service teams on Cloud Foundry, so I used to work on the RabbitMQ team. Mark actually did a stint on the RabbitMQ team as well. Uh, we take open source products such as RabbitMQ, we package them in a couple of layers so that they can be used with Cloud Foundry, and then we put them in another layer so that they can be used by Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So how did we get here? Mark's going to tell you a quick story. Yep, so just a quick history lesson on how we got to where we are today. So back in 2015, in the London office, we are one monolithic team. And our goal here was pretty much to build these on platform services, such as Redis, Cassandra, and RabbitMQ. Um, we kind of took a bet at this point in time that integration with actually PCF would be the hard thing. And just building uh, viable solutions for Rabbit and Redis would be kind of simple. Uh, when you take bets, you know, especially when I bet, I lose. So <laughs> you'll see in a little while. Um, then in 2016, we acquired a company. Our developer team was growing. So we went from a comfortable size of four to six engineers to double that. And it was, engineers were starting to feel a bit of a pain point at this time, saying like, okay, we're working on Rabbit Q problem today. But tomorrow, you know, we work as pairs. You're going to be rolled off that to keep the context flowing. You could be working on a Cassandra problem. So it's not really easy and not like healthy for the team. Uh, continuing on to 2016, we also had to worry about our CI for these services. So we had to dedicate a pair at this time to actually work on our pipeline and keep it going and trying to actually ship these products that we really wanted to make money from. Um, but 
we're starting to see a little bit of a problem here, okay? So the integration part, the part was not really a problem. It was actually packaging up these services. Like we had security practices, we had dependency management, and then we had our own development and testing to look after. So when we had these chores or stories to get uh, features through our pipeline, they're becoming long running and slowing uh, our agile development down. And then we were also actually using GoCD at the time. Um, we, just, we did some investigation, we did some spikes, and we thought, okay, Concourse may be the better solution. So we ported everything to Concourse, and then we ended up with 700 lines of YAML. <laughs> <laughs> so with all these pain points, with all the investigations, we've come to the conclusion, okay, we can't just be one monolithic team. We can't just be keep rotating people through all these services. So we did the pivotal way. We went, okay, look, we're going to dedicate engineers to each service. So we had, in mid-2016, the formation of product-based teams. You can see three. <laughs> um, what happened to our pipelines work? So, Denise. <laughs> right. <laughs> so of course, after we had our nice product-based teams, it wasn't really clear whose job it was to keep this dedicated pipe, uh, pipelines um, track of work going. Of course, nobody wanted to touch it because um, if you recall from Elizabeth's talk, uh, there's this idea of tragedy of the commons. When something is a shared resource with no clear ownership assigned, nobody will maintain it. So things got painful, um, which is at the point where we made an observation. Um, we observed that multiple services teams in Pivotal to R&D were doing kind of the same thing. So like I mentioned earlier, a data service uh, in order to run on PCF needs to live inside of a release artifact, um, which is a, an executable that comes with, you know, like in the case of RabbitMQ, your Rabbit server, your metrics, your logging, all of your, te your telemetry tools. Um, once you have that release artifact, you then need to package it in another artifact that, so that it can run on PCF, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. <laughs> So we noticed that um, not only were teams doing similar things, they were doing those similar things also in a similar manner. So teams were writing very similar integration tests. They were writing very similar regression tests to the point where different teams had pipelines that almost looked the same with just slight differences here and there. So we asked ourselves a question. Can we cut down on duplicated efforts and approach CI in a smarter and more sustainable way without imposing opinions on how teams ought to build software. So the reason why I want to highlight this is because um, in all my time at Pivotal, I've always noticed that nobody from you know, on high has ever come down to the engineers and said, you must like, start doing things this way. Um, at Pivotal, we like to learn. Um, and we believe that everyone in the organization has something valuable to contribute. So this is a. But I call this the onion. So this is the onion that, um, through many conversations with uh, senior, leader, uh, senior leadership of the company, um, I started to realize that from uh, like the spread of knowledge ha begins with experiments. Um, experiments happen on one team. And so the middle of this onion represents the least validated and sort of the most experimental, the most open to shifting uh, practices. Um, as things radiate out through this onion, they become more established, more validated across different teams doing slightly different things. So I'll sort of explain what these things are. An experiment is something that one team just tries. It's low cost, low impact. Um, it's something that can be easily fixed. For example, a team says, we want to write this new service using Golang. No one else has ever written Golang before at this company. As more people on that team pick up Golang best practices, this becomes what we call tribal knowledge. And the reason I call it tribal knowledge is because it's in the heads of individuals. So if those people were to leave the company or go elsewhere, they would take that knowledge with them. Um, as tribal knowledge disperses within the team, maybe somebody on the team will say, hey, this is really useful. Maybe we should like, modify our Vim config to have Go formatter or like, you know, uh, implement some Go best practices with tooling somehow. So at the point where, it becomes, um, where things become automated, uh, that's when you sort of start to untribe knowledge. And of course, like, automation and tooling can be dispersed among multiple teams at the point where many teams are starting to use these tools and follow these practices, they become best practice, which, again, is not a rule. Um, to me, to us, best practice is a set of recommended defaults for new projects. So when it came to this pipeline, the question we asked ourselves was, well, right now all this concourse knowledge, all this CI knowledge is in the heads of individuals. Can we untribe that knowledge 
and turn it into automation and tooling so that we can move it further out this onion and spread this information more effectively throughout the organization. So we, asked, we, uh, we made a hypothesis, which is that um, we believe that we can create a product, an internally facing product, I'll explain what that is in one second, that enables teams to follow best practices by default so that they can spend more time on features and less time on fixing and developing bespoke pipelines that were ever so slightly different, but not in ways that really mattered. So what do we, what do we mean by a product? Um, of course, like by product, we don't mean that we took this pipeline to market. We're not like hosting it in, you know, like in the real world or anything. Um, I mean, we applied product practices to it, the way that Elizabeth spoke a little bit about product practices on Pivotal Labs. Those are sort of the same behaviors that we apply to developing this internally facing tool with only internal customers. So a product, in our minds, have it has a well understood problem space. So we're solving a specific problem. We're not trying to boil the ocean. Um, it has a product manager, a person whose job it is to triage incoming requests, a roadmap, which is sort of your long-term, your six-month, 12-month plan, a backlog, which is your one to six-week plan, and dedicated engineering effort. So we conducted an experiment. The experiment is PCF product pipeline. <laughs> so. We have a team, we have a new team. We've got our data services and we've got a dedicated team for building a uh, generic solution that these teams can consume to ship their products. So we have, like, of course, our engineers, our product manager, and the tools that we need to actually build this. So just as a mindful gap, like before we talk about the PCR product, let's make abundantly clear what it was not. <laughs> So it was not another throw it over the wall pattern. Okay. <laughs> it was not a hosted software as a service either. <laughs> Just making sure everyone's awake. <laughs> the PCF product, so the aim of the PCF product pipeline was to accept a much smaller scale user config and generate that uh, a, a concourse build plan. But we didn't have to use concourse. Like we, as I said, we've used GoCD in the past. We could have continued to use GoCD. In that case, we probably would have used XML or JSON. But we are of the opinion that concourse did a little better. But still, I know GoCD are sponsors. They're awesome too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just quick hands again, like have people seen and used concourse before? Awesome, I'll talk to you people. <laughs> so Concourse is an open source workflow automation tool that lets you build declarative stateless pipelines as a definition. But, and here's their GitHub uh, page. You can see underneath Concourse, it's just a continuous thing doer. It doesn't say it's a CI tool, it just, just happens to be the, what you can use it for. It's just one of the many things. I remember when I joined Pivotal, like I was two weeks <coughs> into the office and we had a colleague over from the Toronto office and he was telling me the power of this amazing tool. And I was saying, like, how is it so amazing? And he, he showed me their concourse deployment. And what do I see? I see a pipeline just for ordering Domino's pizzas. So like, <laughs> and I had, a, it had a full pipeline. Like, there was around six or seven concourse jobs. You don't worry about the term terminology, but like <laughs> ordering, customizing your pizza, then actually paying for your pizza. It was an incredible sight and <laughs> just <laughs> showed you the power it is. But then, okay, why do we want concourse for building services? So, sorry for the text. But we had the concourse provide us integrations for the platforms we needed. So PCF, for example, Bosch directors, everything. These are all first class resources. It gave us a stateless environment. So it was building up these containers and it was just isolated from the world unless you really wanted it to be. Run it again, doesn't have any impact on the previous or the next one we are shipping a product, so we need a powerful way of managing how we're going to ship it and also keeping track of our versions. And we are using, we are, as a, we're building a generic solution, and we couldn't just work with Redis. It needed to work for Rabbit, it needed to work for Cassandra and other teams. So we had to have the power to build these scripts and let Concourse sort of be opinionated on what, how they're going to be executed. And it looks awesome. <laughs> it's a really nice design. And you can see just a quick example of one section of our pipeline that we had built. So 
just at a very high level. At the very top left, you see, I don't know if you probably can't read it all, but there's something called a Git product. And if I make a commit to the RabbitMQ Git repository, it has to flow through pretty much every single job, and they must all be green for that commit to be shippable. So that has to flow through. And it's just a really intuitive design. Things light up in yellow when they're running, and you know, it's nice. <laughs> so how do we get to that? <laughs> well, Concourse gives us the Fly CLI, so it takes this YAML file, we throw it into a Fly CLI by Concourse, and we get a UI. And then we started to wondering, so we had 700 lines of YAML to look at at the beginning. I said, okay, what is the most common sections of this YAML? What is so common between all those teams? What do they really just want to give us? Credentials is mainly one thing. They're Git repositories where those lo are located. So we were, our aim was really just to get rid of 90% of that YAML, just to be able to have like less than 100 lines of YAML, and we'll expand it out into the full-blown concourse pipeline. And it was usually came through this script, set pipeline. Take all your config, mash it into another YAML file, throw it to the Fly CLI, you have your pipeline. When we started, we had lots of unknowns. <laughs> you know, like we, we had to integrate with infrastructure. Who was going to be in charge of managing that infrastructure? Um, how is it going to be done? Side note, we did have to do it. <laughs> um, how similar are the team's pipelines right now? You know, like we had to really look and investigate um, what teams, and again, like you know Concourse YAML, but now we're providing you a new way of writing Concourse pipelines. So will you learn another YAML API? And it turns out teams were picking it up. You know, they were consuming it. So we started in London. We had our normal teams, Sandra Rabbit, Redis, and lately PKS, but then, Somehow, we got wind that teams in America were using this, and we're like, okay, when did you guys start using this? And service metrics in Denver, and then you got as far as San Francisco, a PCF health watch in MySQL. So teams are really take, bought into the benefit of what this product was giving them. But there was challenges of building a pipeline, and it's, there's no different to building any other product, really. It's like, users not adopting new releases, you know? So it's like, Redis would ask for a feature, and then Rabbit would like, okay, we don't really need that feature. So they could sort of fall behind, and like Redis could ask for another feature, and Rabbit are still not interested. And like, if that was that, uh, you know, they, they're just not buying into the value of new releases at times. And we were also shipping at maybe at a two weeks rate, thinking we were great, but that was just causing more pain when teams wanted to catch up. So in that case, we had to play consultancy at time. We're saying, like, okay, you wanted this feature, you don't know, you're saying you don't know how to turn it on, so we'll go in to your config and show you this is how you turn it on. <laughs> so, you know. And then that also had drawbacks in saying, okay, you, now we're doing so much of their pipeline work, they're kind of taking even more steps back and say, okay, this is really not our CI, and when it breaks, it's not really our problem. Maybe it's the, pro the product team's problem. So not feeling empowered to own their own pipeline. And because we are mainly focused on taking feature requests to actually be given development work, we didn't really know how to get ahead of the service teams. 10 minutes, okay. Uh, so we are like catching up with them and so on. And as I said earlier, Redis were asking for features, then maybe Ra would ask for features, and other teams are asking for features, that, and they're all completely independent. So feature flag explosion in our code base. And then when it worked, how did we actually want to validate what we were doing? How are we doing the right thing? We had no way of gathering these metrics of saying, hey, this team set a pipeline, but what version they set a pipeline on? Are they still even using it? As I said, we didn't know teams in America were actually using it. Just, they just happened to find us in their GitHub organization. And then on the flip side, we have consuming the pipeline. <laughs> Yeah, so just for a tiny bit of context, um, the reason why we split uh, the sort of like building and consuming experiences is because Mark worked on the team that um, was behind the pipeline, and I worked on RabbitMQ at the time, which consumed it. So there were difficulties for, there, there were good things and also some difficult things for us too. So the good parts included um, the ability to learn from other people's mistakes. So as Mark mentioned, Redis and Rabbit different features landed at different times. Sometimes they were kind of same because they were cross-platform things that we all needed to do. But because we tackled these problems at different times, it meant that um, if Redis happened to do something two weeks before us and they learned a lot from it, and they were able to take those learnings and push them back onto Mark's team, the pipeline team, then the pipeline's team could 
sort of enshrine those learnings in the next version of PCF, or, uh, of PCF product pipeline. So all Rabbit had to do was bump our pipeline to consume that version, which is pretty awesome. It meant that it saved us a lot of code and it saved us a lot of pain because otherwise Redis and Rabbit would both have to go through this development and learning pain. Um, so another benefit was that for new team members, um, including myself, I joined the RabbitMQ team when I had been doing software engineering for about a year and a half. So it was a very, very scary, very steep learning curve. Um, we have a lot of surface area to learn in platform development generally. So uh, I sort of like drew this diagram on a napkin in a bar. Um, but if you imagine your learning curve and the context you have to overcome to start to be productive, um, you can either front load all of that and learn all the things really quickly. Of course, different people have different capacities. Um, different people have different tolerance levels for things like imposter syndrome, for things like burnout. So a steep learning curve in the beginning can be difficult. It can um, potentially not set you up for success. Or if you, can have, if you can introduce tooling that strategically smoothens out parts of the learning curve, it means that you can potentially learn in a more sustainable way. So you can defer picking up context until you absolutely need to. Um, in some cases, this can be very beneficial. For me as a new engineer, I felt it was really beneficial. And the final benefit, um, which is a huge one, is that PCF product pipeline gave us security built in by default. So a lot of the same security practices were common to all the artifacts. Um, there's a lot of research on the power of defaults. If you give something someone, if you give something to someone and it's switched on by default, it's quite unlikely that they'll you know, opt out of it. So like a policy example from the real world is organ donation. Um, if you switch to an opt-out system rather than opt-in, you have much, much higher rates of organ donation um, across like many, many countries has been validated in. So apply that same insight to security and things that really matter when you're developing software. If you have a common tool, like a pipeline or a set of scripts, um, think about ways that you can nudge people into doing the right thing. So what were the downsides? Um, in the early days, composability was very, very limited. So of course, Mark talked about the feature flags, but really, um, we took a monolith first approach because there were a lot of unknowns. I actually think there wasn't a deliberate decision. It, a monolith happened because there were unknowns. Um, it was a fast changing world. Nobody really knew what was coming up you know, 12 months down the line. So some teams chose not to adopt. So some teams, for example, said, we really care about turbulence testing. Can you put turbulence testing in this pipeline? But that represents a huge change for everybody who's using it. So um, you either have to go all in or sort of go your own way. And the second thing is, um, back to my earlier point, uh, deferred learning can be good in some cases, but it can still represent a form of technical debt because what if something happens? Like what if some security vulnerability happens that prompts you to release earlier than planned? Um, so it's something to think about. Cool, so what are our conclusions? Some key takeaways that we learned from this experiment. Um, so we believe that addressing duplication would be the chief benefit of having a common pipeline. But we learned actually that sharing knowledge was the far greater benefit. The ability for teams without deep knowledge of how to build PCF artifacts to hit the ground running and be on their way within a week rather than having to learn concourse um, was massive. Like that represented a huge lowering of the barrier to entry, which meant that teams could be more productive from day one. And the second thing we learned is that um, we focus a lot on the day two experience. So we focus on upgrades and reliability and making the experience better for people who had already adopted it. PCF Tile Pipeline had kind of a bad day one experience. Like not a lot of thought went into the documentation. But the reason for that is because all of the consumers were internal. So when your consumers are internal, it means that you always have the ability to cross team pair. That's obviously not true when you have customers in the field, or it may be true to a limited extent. But in our case, by focusing development effort on day two rather than day one meant that we could more effectively enable teams um, to, uh, to deliver more effectively. So another thing we learned was that um, user research could have been taken a little bit more seriously and could have been thought about a little bit earlier on. So um, the feature flag explosion, which we keep coming back to, this is one of the reasons why the day one experience was so difficult for people, because nobody knew what these feature flags were doing. 
Um, when the PCF product pipeline team finally gained some bandwidth and was able to do user research, interview the teams that had adopted it, it turned out that this was a source of pain. So what the team did was they went through and audited all the feature flags, learned that 90% of them weren't being used by anyone anymore, and got rid of them. So this is a perfect example of when earlier user research could have been an easy way to improve that day one experience, could have been a low cost way to do it. So where is PCF product pipeline today? Um, so today it is a project that's sort of owned by the community. Um, the reason why this is okay is because Rabbit, Redis, uh, these other teams have been using it for over a year now. So everyone sort of knows the domain, everyone understands how to configure Concourse at this point. Um, so new features are delivered from these teams via pull requests, they'll review each other. Um, all the services teams are empowered to cut new releases. Uh, and occasionally, Mark will still log on to close the PR, even though he's not on the team anymore, which is definitely scalable. So what, are, what did we learn? So should my organization, should your organization set aside a dedicated team to build some awesome CI tooling? And of course, our answer is, that depends, which is the best answer you could get at a conference talk, right? So um, it depends on a couple of things. First of all, notice that PCF product pipeline began as a like, track of work, a series of uh, stories in an existing backlog. So the first thing you need to ask yourself is, is there a team that's already spending an entire track of work? Is there a full-time effort already going on in someone else's backlog? If the answer is yes, then the next thing to think about is, um, why do you want to do this thing? Do you just want to reduce duplication? Because if you just want to reduce duplication, from what we've learned, we don't think that's a sufficient reason to invest dedicated engineering effort. But if you are dealing with duplication and you have unanswered questions of ownership, then that's a more compelling reason to dedicate engineering <coughs> effort to this thing. So the final thought we'll leave you with is, um, Every so often, our engineering directors say, we want our teams to collaborate more. We want there to be more cross-team sharing. So I want to break down what that actually means. Um, when, when people say we want teams to collaborate more, it means that they want teams to share. But what do they want teams to share? So from low cost to high cost, teams can either share knowledge and documentation, which is you just write an email, you just write a Slack message to someone else, it's off in the ether, it's there. That's really cheap. It takes only a couple seconds to do that. A little more expensive is to share your tools and resources because someone else, for someone else, your scripts might not work out of the box. Um, and the most expensive thing you can share across teams, of course, is engineering time, so for teams to cross-team pair. <coughs> when you say you want teams to collaborate more, you need to think about what level of sharing is required. So in this case, we learned that for PCF product pipeline, the right level of sharing was the tooling and the resources. It was more complicated than just documentation and just knowledge, but it wasn't so complicated that it required cross-team pairing all the time, like sustained cross-team pairing. <coughs> so the slides will be on my slides.com profile after this. Um, I'll also send it around to Inca and to the conference organizers so you can access them. Um, but that is the end. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. So if anyone...